Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Dolan. This is my wife, Tracy. This is... Oh. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this is Intelligent Disclosure. Welcome. So, um, we are working on a new camera system. I think it's a little bit better than the other one. You can let us know. And did we want to talk about anything before we wanted to talk about anything? Yeah. Uh, what did we do this past week? Well, we've been really getting into the abduction stuff. That's so right. it's sort of been the bulk of our conversations talking about uh, the differences between Jacob and Barbara. Barbara Lamb. Barbara Lamb. David Jacobs, Barbara Lamb, Yvonne Smith, and uh, personal experiences, accounts we've heard from other people. Uh, it's uh, And accounts that you're reading that are really from the 19, early 1900s. That's right. So on... Um on our website, Richard Olin Members, we've got actually a very lively series of conversations that are taking place there. Um, Tracy and I have just done a, a, a very kind of a comb through version of uh, David Jacobs walking among us. And we also have a copy of Barbara Lamb's book uh, that she co-authored uh, called Meet the Hybrids. In fact, I did an interview with Barbara just earlier, uh, a few days ago, and that will be on YouTube. You'll be able to hear that soon. And you've got two abduction researchers who have, I mean, diametrically opposite mm -hmm. takes on what, what we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. I, I, th I think that's kind of symptomatic of like, there's a, a, a divide, a fault, a, like the San Andreas fault in, it's in ufology as well as in culture. I, I think that there's a lot of mm -hmm. things going on there. Mm -hmm. So I think we just wanted to talk about it. We have a lot of folks on uh, who've been communicating with us who've been very much inter interested in David's work. Uh, but there's other people interested in other elements. There's the recent study by the, the group Free, uh -huh. uh, which we have right here, Beyond UFOs. This is the, um, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences. A lot of people have probably heard of this book. And they have a, a very different take on the abduction phenomenon than, say, what uh, Bud Hopkins or David Jacobs has been saying. So what's going on? You, are we, we have good ETs, we have bad ETs. Who's right? Is anyone right? Is everyone wrong? Is everyone a little bit right? Multiple agendas, singular, single agenda. I know. And then, you know, a lot of these experiences don't really fit. They don't seem to fit well-defined boundaries. Did you want to mention that you had an experience? Yeah, some people know, some people don't. But uh, that is what brought me to the field a while ago. I was uh, investigating, you know, what was going on in my own life. So... Uh, I was traveling around to conferences just trying to sort it out for myself. Um, so yeah, I don't uh, bring it up and I don't comment about it that often, but every once in a while, you know, when we talk about things, I might just weigh in from some of the things that have happened to me. Mm -hmm. I do tend to talk about one of my experiences more because it was a conscious experience. And for those of you who've been watching this for a long time, you you may have heard me talk about it. You were with somebody else when it I happened. I was with somebody well. else. I, uh, yeah, I'm most comfortable talking about it because it was it happened in the daytime. Uh, in And uh, it was a conscious experience. Someone was sitting beside me. We both recall the same thing, the same being uh, that looked a very particular way. And, uh, but we were not able to recount too much from it. And one of the reasons I don't want to say too much about it, uh, cause I did recently do a regression is because I don't want to, um, um, what's the word? I don't want to, um, well, she hasn't gone through any kind of regression. She hasn't done regression. a, re a regression wanted. and I, I don't want to influence that at all because, you know, it, it's not really about what I say and what I think it's, it's about um, what's coming up. So, you know, when, when she does do this, it will be wonderful to be able to compare. Absolutely. Uh, so I just don't want to taint that. And, um, I think you're doing this just the right way, honestly. And I'm very glad, like you've told the world, yes, you've had the parts I consciously remember. Yeah. Very interesting and so experience. She. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, let's just leave it at that for now. Mm -hmm. But I think we will want to come back to this probably, maybe. Yeah, sometime. I mean, I'm still thinking about the regression. There's there's a lot there to consider, mm -hmm. and you know, I think we'll get into some of the, the some of these things later in terms of um, their ability to cognitively hijack our minds. You know, we we always need to take that into account. So, um, one thing I'd like to ask you later, sure, later tonight, 
is the confidence, like when, when people go through hypnotic regression, mm -hmm. right? Like the real question is, how confident are you that that's an actual memory? And if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I'd be interested in asking you that a little later. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Like when we get into the whole idea of regression, there's the question of, you know, are our memories confabulated? Right. And realizing it's maybe impossible for each person to know, like exactly, is this a real memory or not? But even so, you can have a feeling for it, you can have a sense of how vivid these things are, and I'd be interested in asking you about that. Cool, I Without guess. getting into too much, giving away the game to the other person who we hope will go through a regression. I think that's relevant even when, you know, uh, for people who have had experiences during the night, and, you know, uh, dream experiences where you don't think, you wake up saying to yourself, you know, that was not a dream. But you still, you know, you can't help it. You go through and uh, question everything. Right. Um, it's like you have your two parts of the brain fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. One that knows that it happened, and then there's this other part that's constantly, you know, the skeptic, um, sometimes called the left brain, the skeptic, questioning it. So... I think that's relevant for every experiencer, you know, yeah. uh, there's, that's still going on. Well, maybe we should get into this. Um, yeah. I kind of was wanting to have you here while I gave this, but if you want to just I know, do I like your thing to over there. <laughs> go off camera. <laughs> but but I'm going to try to bring you back in as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. While I, I'll do my little, my little presentation here, mm -hmm. which I've been trying to work this out, but I mm -hmm. real definitely want to get you back in here so we can talk about this yeah. from your perspective. Because there's a lot of people out there who've had experiences, abduction, encounters of one type or another, mm -hmm. and I have a feeling your perspective uh, will be kind of interesting for not just those people, really, for everyone, but definitely for those people. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people here who are here because they've had things that have happened, and right. some people feel certain and some people feel... Uh, don't feel certain about about what it was, but they they know one thing something mm -hmm. is messing with them on some level right. so uh, yeah, anyways, take it away All right. <laughs> okay. I'll be right back she's going to be far far away over in over, over in, in the, the corner. corner in the corner, so I'll just sit right here yeah, so over at um, at Richard Ola members there's been a lot of discussion. Um, mostly by myself, but a lot of the members, they have opportunities to, to chime in and put comments on under various posts. Uh, and we've talked a lot about abduction phenomena. And just right lately, the last couple of months, I would say there's been a lot of interesting conversation about that. And, you know, for myself, I mean, researching UFOs, uh, abductions are always one of those major sub-themes of the phenomenon. And um, I find that there's not a lot of... Um, agreement among researchers. There, has, there wasn't 50 years ago, and actually there isn't even today. Uh, you know, you find among some UFO researchers, they don't agree on whether there were crash retrievals. So is there a, a cover-up? Is it just lights in the sky and, and no one knows what that is? Or is there actual hardware that they've, uh, that they've obtained? And that's a sort of significant fault line right there in terms of what researchers. And then there's another fault line do you believe in abductions or do you not believe in abductions? And then there's another fault line on top of that. What are the nature of these abductions? And actually, the more that I've thought about it over the last few weeks, I think that, to me, that's actually the fundamental fault line in the UFO field, at least in UFO culture, if we can call it a culture. That is, are these beings good or bad? Are they good or are they bad? So I want to talk about that. But before I get into that, I, I have a lot to say on this element of it. Because I, I think in some ways it mirrors our society, our cultural fault lines between liberal and conservative. And I really honestly believe that there is a definite uh, parallel within the UFO field over uh, abductions are a positive experience or abductions are part of something negative and diabolical. So, but before I go there, one thing I will mention is that there's a long, long history of human encounters with something other. Um, I think I've mentioned on these live streams, I've certainly been talking various points. Um, I haven't just been re reviewing Jacob's and other abduction works, but I've been going into the book, the really excellent book by Jacques Vallée and Chris Aubeck. Oh, we just lost our light here. May I turn this back on? 
Well, I think we're okay without it. There we are. are you, did, did we knock that out there? There's something happening down here. Well, all right, let's just leave it alone. I, I think we're fine without it. Um, called Wonders in the Sky. And that's a book that deals with, here we go, ancient, whoops, we're going to lower that a lot. <laughs> um, it goes back with ancient sightings of UFOs um, over the last two millenniums, 2,000 years. What's interesting about it are uh, a number of encounters that people have had with other beings. So when you go back 500 years, um, were people having encounters with what we would call alien beings? And the answer is kind of like, seems like a no, actually, when you really go back through these encounters. There are some that seem suggestive of non-human aliens, but really what the most of them are, like, for example, a typical uh, one would be 500 years ago in Spain, uh, a group of people would see a shaft of light coming from the heavens or from the sky going down to the ground. And they would see this maybe over a period of a couple of days. And then someone eventually would go over there to the source and they would see uh, what they described as the Virgin Mary, who would say to them, I want you to build a church in this location. And the person would inevitably say, well, I'm a, I'm a poor, illiterate peasant. Who's going to listen to me? And the Virgin Mary would say, I don't care. This is your mission. Build it. And um, this happened in Spain, this happened in Italy, this happened in Poland, this happened in Germany, this happened all throughout medieval Europe, this type of story. And indeed, many, well, not many, but a number of churches will have in their history this type of event as having taken place, and they'll describe it. Um, this is based at the location where there was a sighting of the Virgin Mary. So that's different from a sighting of an alien, but in some of these cases, the other, the trappings are not that different. Interesting, you know, unusual shafts of light or, or, or stars that move in unusual ways. There are, there are definite sightings in ancient times of UFOs, what we would describe as a UFO, that is of a, a light that would um, divide into two or three and then rejoin and then take off. Like that's classic UFO. And those sightings you see in Europe and you see them in the Far East, Japan and China, going back many, many centuries. But these sightings of beings, uh, what I am feeling, and I think I'm certainly not alone here, is that people who've studied this phenomenon tend to see it as people are seeing and responding to beings, and they're interpreting those, that phenomena in the culture that they know. You know, they are expecting to see the Virgin Mary, and they see the Virgin Mary. So that's very interesting. Does that mean that they're actually seeing the Virgin Mary or does that mean that they're not seeing aliens who are simply appearing to them as they want them to appear? Well, who knows? I don't, th I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone really can get the answer to that. But what we can see, though, is that people are reacting in the, um, in the context of the psychological and, and sociological cultural expectations of that time, by and large, by and large. When you get into the 20th century, there have been a number of sightings of other beings that people have, have uh, reported. You know, after the, uh, the 1940s, when flying saucers were part of world culture increasingly, there were a number of sightings of, of what appear to be alien creatures. So there was a famous wave of these sightings in 1954 in France. Uh, that spread to Italy, that was in Germany, that actually was in a lot of Europe, and it spread even into the Middle East. Um, and then later in that year, there were a spate of these types of sightings in South America. Now, in, in France and in Italy and in Europe, they were typically of short um, people, three, four feet tall, so like the size of how we describe greys today. Um, and there were other similarities to greys. So they would have large heads, bald heads. Um, they had the ability to paralyze witnesses. Um, they were interested in taking samples of plants and sometimes animals. Um, and people were helpless to stop them. In South America, they were also short, but they were different. They were muscular. They were sometimes hairy. They didn't look like gray aliens at all. They were a totally different type of phenomenon. So what does that mean? 
Does that mean that you had short, hairy, humanoid aliens trying to abduct people who would then fight them and sometimes resist the abduction by, by physically assaulting enough of these little aliens because that was reported in South America. Is that what they were dealing with down there? Or was there something else going on? Some kind of cultural phenomenon, some kind of hysteria, sometimes people just making stuff up. What was the truth? I don't know. I don't know what the truth is. But now in, in many of the European cases, they were, some of them were pretty well researched in my opinion. And I would say that a number of those witnesses were legit. And in fact, there are a number of cases where there was ground traces left by landed craft and the, you know, the police investigated a number of these and there seemed to be a lot to go on. So I'm absolutely of the belief that people were seeing short aliens. Those aliens didn't seem good. They didn't seem bad. They just seemed like they were here doing, well, extraterrestrial stuff, coming down, taking plant samples, investigating the earth and so on. So that fits the profile of aliens who are here to explore, to uh, maybe, maybe to abduct, but really to explore and to learn. As you go through the 50s and 60s, you start getting into abduction accounts. There's the uh, Antonio Villas Boas case in Brazil from 1958, where 57, excuse me, where he uh, said he was a farmer in Brazil. He was taken aboard a craft. He was forced to have sexual relations with an uh, a alien human hybrid. Certainly, is what this woman looks like when we get her description. She was like partly alien, partly human. Um, interesting case, and it was unknown for many, many years. Then you have the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, where they are encountering uh, beings that, again, are similar to how we would describe greys, a little different, uh, but they're short, bald, large heads, all of that. And Betty and Barney are each subjected to um, different types of tests, reproduction, um, Betty's uh, ova, uh, her eggs, excuse me, appear to have been taken, Barney's sperm was taken, Classic abduction, where these evil aliens, they didn't seem to be evil. Betty talked about them later through regression, saying that she actually had a friendly conversation with, with these people, as far as friendly could be. You have another case in France in the mid-60s, in Valensole, France, a lavender farm, a French farmer is out in the field. I think this is a very good case. He sees a landed craft. He sees a couple of short alien beings that paralyze him with a, with a ray gun of some sort, or a ray weapon. And he's paralyzed while they take their plant samples. They seem to chuckle or smile at him. They're not human. They get into their craft and they go. The implication of all of these earlier types of sightings is that they are curious about us. They're stealthy, so they don't want to be seen by human society. They're interested in our reproduction, our species, maybe like in a scientific capacity. That's really the impression you get. That, if, that whole assessment really evolved through the 1960s and 70s. You have cases like the Betty Andreessen abduction cases, which were investigated by Raymond Fowler. Um, and those were very interesting. And now we're getting into what I feel is kind of a classic contemporary understanding of abduction. So Betty Andreessen was a very devout Christian, a spiritually inclined person. And in her regressions that she did with Ray, um, she's talking about an explicitly spiritual experience where she's being taken by short uh, aliens and being told that she's going to meet the one. It's a deeply ex uh, spiritual type of experience. And, you know, Betty said a number of times that you can't really understand these extraterrestrials without having a spiritual orientation. You start really getting this a lot. On the other side of it, you get people like Bud Hopkins. Bud um, started really researching UFOs in a serious way in the late 70s. He writes his first book, uh, Missing Time, in uh, 1981, I believe. And this is where we really get the kind of key formulation that these other beings 
They are interested in us. They can be interested in us multiple times throughout our lifetime. They're interested in our bloodline. So if they've taken you, they may take your daughter or your son because they want something about your bloodline. That's important. Abductions can happen over the course of a lifetime. Doesn't seem much you can do about it. It has to do with reproduction. Seems to have to do with creation of hybrid human aliens of some sort. Bud really put a lot of this together at the time. I would say that Bud Hopkins was the first person really to try to get into the mindset of these other beings and to try to understand what they were, what they were about. And for him, what they were about was something not good. They took people without permission. They abducted you without your permission. They did things to your body. They did things possibly to your mind. Uh, not cool, not, not legitimate, and we need to, we need to be aware of to, and, and really to, to oppose that to the extent possible. That was his position. Um, and then you have David Jacobs. And I would say that, that David Jacobs has gone much further than Bud Hopkins in his willingness and ability to get behind the wall of what these other beings are about and to try to understand them the way a, a counterintelligence officer, in fact, or a counterintelligence expert would try to understand uh, the enemy. And I think really no one has surpassed what David Jacobs has done in that regard. In other words, um, whereas Bud Hopkins was the first person to try to put together a kind of overall assessment of the abduction phenomenon, I would say Jacobs is the first person really to ex try to ex extrapolate and make sense of the phenomenon on an even deeper level based on all the data that he was getting. For example, for example, uh, Dave Jacobs was the first person to lay out the process of an abduction. He did this in his book, Secret Life, years ago, 25, 27, whatever years ago. Uh, he, you know, got a sliver of the process from one person, he got another sliver of the process from another person, and this, these sections over here. And what he ended up doing, this is actually an incredible feat, is he put them together. He said, oh, this one matches up with this one. Okay, this is part. And then after that comes this, and after this comes this, and this and this. And he put it together in a way that no one had ever done. And that's, that's really what A Secret Life is about. There's much more to that book. But it's, it's a fascinating book, and I think it doesn't really get enough attention, in my opinion, for the significance of what it really represents. But that was like 1991, 92, I believe. Um, and then later, you know, David never stopped. So he then wrote his book, The Threat, at the end of the 1990s. And, and more recently, uh, about five years ago, Walking Among Us. And again, he's trying to analyze them, these other beings, based on the data that he's receiving. Again, I would say it's basically counterintelligence work. And so what is his scenario? I really want to lay this out as concisely and as well as I can. And I'm, I'm going to miss a lot here. But basically, in his scenario... They, these beings, are engaged in a program of planetary takeover. That's the words that he uses. Now, instead of attacking the Earth like in an Independence Day scenario, you know, bringing the heavy guns out and blowing up our cities, they're not doing that. Why are they not doing that? Well, I don't think he knows, but his, the information that he's getting from his abductees that he's regressing is that their plan is a little bit different. It's to infiltrate. Maybe they want our infrastructure. Maybe they want our 5G. I'm not kidding. I mean, maybe they want our future artificial intelligence. Who, the hell, who knows? We, are, we have built, like we really un tend to underestimate the value of the technological infrastructure that we're building on our planet right now. And so you could, I think in his assessment, we've been sized up quite recently by this particular group of beings led, in his opinion, by the mantis beings who have then created all the versions of the greys that we encounter. That's his take on it. So the mantas are running it. They create various types of greys, tall greys, short greys, and then a whole array of alien-human hybrids. And toward that end, it is the goal of infiltration using human-looking uh, beings that have just enough of the ET DNA, the alien DNA, to allow them to have neurological control over the base population of the planet. And that's what it's all about, as far as his take on it. So, 
They, uh, they abduct people, in his view, in order to create these human-looking hybrids, so human beings are valuable for their genetic material. And then contemporary abductees, in his view, are being taken as a way to train these human-looking hybrids, he calls them hubrids, so that because none of them have any kind of decent social skills, they're raised on a craft, and they, they come down, and, I mean, reading through the transcripts and the, um, the conversations he has with these people is fascinating. Um, you get case after case of uh, people describing the most utterly socially inept, clueless skills of these hybrids. Like, how do you, how do you turn on an oven? How do you operate a dishwasher? Um, how do you take food out of the refrigerator? Like the most basic, like you really, I find myself thinking like these people are planning to take over the planet. Like they, they're totally incompetent. But there's one, there's one skill that they have, which is the ability to get inside your head and to control your thoughts and to make you do things even against your will because you don't realize that they're against your will at the time. That's the thing that they can do and they're very, very good at that. And so that's the skill. And then what you do get in his uh, assessment is that they are getting to the point now where their social skills actually have improved. A number of them have lived on Earth for a long enough period of time. Some of them live here. They walk among us and their social skills are at least up to the point where you wouldn't notice them necessarily in a, in a crowd, like they would blend in. However, there's some very big things, very important things to note. You might think, well, all right, so who cares? So some of the aliens are living among us, big deal. Well, they are all talking, these abductees are talking about how the hybrids are talking about the change that is to come. That is the change when something big is going to happen, seems like a takeover, and everything's going to be different, and they're going to basically run our world. Um, here's the key thing. These beings, as far as his data is, his people, his abductees are telling him, are completely, totally telepathic. The mantis beings and all of the greys and all of the hybrids are fully telepathic. And what that means, if you have a telepathic society, you have no privacy. That's really the thing. And in this scenario, that's really what it appears to be. There's no privacy and there's no free will. Everyone is created for a specific job. All the greys are artificially created. All the hybrids are artificially created. So they all have a job. They have a purpose. They don't even seem to sleep very much. They sleep a little bit. There's no art. There's no music. There's no creativity. There's no sense of individuality. This is like, this society would be the worst nightmare imaginable. There's nothing worse in my view, and I'm sure in your view, than to live in that kind of a world. Which, by the way, uh, guess what? That's the world you're moving toward, whether it's through neurological control by manted aliens or a 5G network and a social credit system like what China's got and is going to be coming here, you bet. Uh, it's all happening anyway, but we'll come back to that for another, <laughs> another time. Um, but the society that he's that he's seeing through his people, as I'm talking about Jacobs, is a complete totalitarian nightmare and you wouldn't want any part of that world whatsoever. In his assessment, the abduction phenomenon is happening for that purpose of infiltration. And look, you might agree with this, you might not agree with this. My feeling is his assessment of this, his work on this is very, very good. And it's it could be wrong or it could be incomplete. I think more likely than wrong, if, if there's a flaw with it, the flaw would be that it's incomplete. And that's going to bring me now to this assessment of the other side of the ET phenomenon, the good ETs. Are there good ETs? I don't know. I don't really know if anyone knows. There are people who have opinions, but let's talk about this. All right? Because the fact is that not all of people's alleged encounters with ETs are seen as negative. I mentioned this book right here, Beyond UFOs. This is, uh, just came out earlier this year. And I, I don't, I can't say that I've read all of this book. I have read some of this book now. 
when I have my moments and I'm able to go through it. And so I have a sense of what they're about. And I've also, I just mentioned, met with uh, Barbara Lamb, and this is her book, Meet the Hybrids. And um, I would never say that I am an expert on this side of the ET scenario. Now, in my 20 years or so being part of the UFO social culture that exists, I can say without a doubt that I have encountered uh, multiple times, more than I can imagine, um, discussions with people who have told me personally that they've had um, encounter experience with benevolent ETs. And I will say this, this is actually every time I go to a conference, particularly in California or Arizona, Sedona particularly, you get this all the time. All right, Southern California, but also Northern California, um, any place out West, this uh, predominates, I would say, as opposed to out East in the US where, where we live. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment because I think it's somewhat significant. But back to the good ETs. All right, so I talked about this study by Free. That's the foundation uh, for research into extraterrestrial and extraordinary encounters. So what they did is an online survey of over 4,000 people, 4,200 people. And they essentially said, have you, if you've had experiences that you feel are uh, extraterrestrial, answer these questions. And they took all of that information. So look, right off the bat, anyone can criticize the methodology of this study. It's wide open for criticism. And I have to say rightly so, because it's not, it's not really uh, scientifically defensible. That doesn't mean that there's not valuable information in it. So I'm not trying to dismiss this study by any means, but I'm just saying initially, you can't just take this as, as some people are trying to portray it as a straight up scientific study. I just don't think it's quite at that level. All right, there's some very, very intelligent individuals who've worked on this. I know a number of them fairly, very well, and they're good people and smart people, and so they're worth listening to. But I just have to say the methodology is clearly open to criticism. The other thing I would say is that this is not really a UFO book per se. In fact, you know, the title says it, it's beyond UFOs. It's, it's something of a, I don't want to say it's a fully religious book, but it is somewhat of a religious kind of a book. And I say this for the main reason that, you know, the, the theme is very explicit. Consciousness and the paranormal, this is from the book, and psychic aspects of this phenomenon is the key, they say, to understanding this complex phenomenon of what we call UFOs. Instead of, they argue, the traditional materialistic uh, perspective of nuts and bolts ufology. So this book, Beyond UFOs, is a rejection of what they call nuts and bolts ufology and arguing, as uh, my friend and colleague Grant Cameron has been saying for a number of years now, consciousness is the key to understanding this phenomenon. If you don't get consciousness, you're not gonna get UFOs. That's Grant, and that's really the focus of this book. So it's a significant group of very dedicated researchers who have come to this conclusion. So we need to understand that. The messages, by and large, in this book of the non-human intelligences that people are discussing or saying that they've encountered are, uh, I would have to say, classic, quintessential sort of Southern California New Age platitudes. And I sound this, and it sounds like a negative thing. You, Tracy, you can jump in later, comment on whether you think this is overly negative. But to me, it's basically love, unity, oneness, is what the ETs are telling us that we need to focus on. Um, we're too aggressive, we're too competitive, we're, uh, we're damaging the planet. You know, we've all heard this many, many times. Um, universal consciousness is linked uh, through all beings in the universe. And in fact, one person said, like, I'm, I'm linked with the universe itself. I don't know what that means, but that's what some of these people have said. So to me, these are like religious experiences. And indeed, um, I find it interesting because when I look through the long history of contact that people have had with this 
other intelligence. Going back through the centuries, those are also often interpreted as religious experiences. So I think there's a commonality here. So now you can look at this in a couple of ways. So a hardcore skeptic would say, well, pff, that just proves that all of these are just out of the imagination. You know, how do you know that any of this is anything other than what's inside someone's own thoughts? Uh, there's no, is there any real physical evidence, even um, hypnotic regressions that, you know, where someone's coming in with detailed um, assessments of being taken. This is mostly uh, conscious memories and there's not, there's not a, um, I, I don't really see, I, maybe I just haven't seen yet, but uh, this is simply alleged abductees or experiencers writing in about their experiences. So there's not a whole lot of ability to sort of check or critique that. What's powerful about it is that there's a lot of consistency in what these people are saying. But again, what I would ask is, are we dealing with a cultural phenomenon? Is that what we're dealing with? Now, before I answer that, or before I try to answer that, I just want to mention, again, I uh, did an interview with Barbara Lamb just a few days ago, and that's uh, not yet available on YouTube, but it will be very soon. And I happen to adore Barbara. Tracy and I are very close mm -hmm. with Barbara. Um, she's a very experienced hypno-regressionist. I don't know, is that, is that the word? She's a very experienced <laughs> regressionist uh, and hypnotherapist. And... Um, has, I think, regressed, she said, something like 2,000 different people, lots of folks. So Barbara is very deeply experienced, and Barbara is polar opposite, polar opposite of David Jacobs in her assessment of what we're dealing with, all right? So, um, you know, her feeling is these beings are here to help us, by and large, by and large. Now, in, in my conversations with her, she said, look, there's a lot of different types that are out there, so not all are operating from the, um, what's the phrase? Oh, service to others as opposed to service to self. You hear this a lot. Um, and some are operating on a very materialistic, you know, third dimension, third density sort of uh, uh, paradigm, whereas others are operating at a higher level. So there's a lot of other beings that are here. This is her take on it, and I don't think she's alone in that assessment. So the one thing that I want to say on her behalf because I she knows that I don't really fully agree with this perspective and that's fine I told her so but I will say this on behalf of Barbara she is adamant that she comes to her conclusions not based on her own personal belief system but based on what she's getting through the regressions of the people that she's working with so she like David is going where she feels the data is leading her and the data is leading her toward the fact that these beings are essentially in a process of trying to help humanity uh, engage in a spiritual evolution. What is that spiritual evolution? You hear a lot about raising frequencies, elevating our consciousness, and opening up uh, things like heart chakras and so forth so that we are one with the Galactic Federation. Yeah. They talk about the Galactic Federation. Lots of folks talk about this. So when I hear about this and then I hear about the mantids and the greys abducting people to create a race of hubrids to take over planet Earth, I'm like, we're dealing with two absolutely fundamentally different perspectives and realities here. Like that, the distressing thing to me simply as someone who researches this, is I've got, you know, you've got the example of two, in the case of David and Barbara, very experienced, intelligent, knowledgeable, sincere, dedicated researchers, because each of them fulfill all of those categories, who have done a lot of work on this phenomenon, and they have come to fundamentally opposite conclusions about what we're dealing with. Now, if that's not distressing, then I don't know what is. Um, I asked Barbara about this. I'm going to be talking to David about this in, the near, in I think, in the next few weeks. So I'm going to ask him, too. In her opinion, she feels, look, David's got something there. She does not dismiss what he says. 
I think it's very significant. Her take is he's onto something, but um, I mean, she's always gracious. She's always very diplomatic. I think her, her feeling is he's getting something, but he's not getting the whole picture. So what I would say is this, are we talking about the difference between Philadelphia and Southern California? Jacobs lives in Philadelphia. Barbara's out in Southern California. <laughs> I gotta say, if you've, you know, if you've never been to either of those places, if you have been to either of those places or both of those places, you know exactly what I'm talking about, all right? I'm wondering, are we dealing at least to some extent with a case of confirmation bias, at least in part, where people are finding what they are looking for? You know, Southern California is only surpassed, in my opinion, by Sedona, Arizona, as the kind of new age center of all of planet Earth. <laughs> I don't think you can beat it. Um, and that's where Barbara lives. That's where a lot of these, every time I go to California and I talk to people who've had experiences, I mean, so much of it is dominated by this talk about frequency, ascension, higher consciousness. It's definitely a heavily spiritually oriented perspective on the UFO phenomenon that, yeah, some of that exists out east, but not nearly as much. All right, I'm from New York City. Jacobs lives in Philadelphia. They're very similar kinds of places. Like I know Philly fairly well. And I can just say, Philadelphia is not like Southern California. All right. Um, it's very pragmatic in my view. The people there are no BS. It's very, um, you can say materialistic if you want. There's a lot of brilliant people there, obviously. But there's a definite... Um, gritty kind of reality that you get in a place like Philadelphia. I happen to love Philadelphia. Um, but I'm an Easterner, so I think anyone who follows me kind of gets that about me. My point is simply, David out in Philadelphia, is he just more likely to get people who have less of a new age orientation than Barbara is going to get being in Southern California? I think the answer to that is absolutely. Like, no question in my mind. Um, I'm not saying that Barbara has been looking for people of a certain type, but those are simply the people that have come to her. And I asked her this question, and I think she, she agreed with me that there's some of this uh, factoring in. It's not that David or she is looking for certain types of people, but that there's a kind of a natural, almost a gravitational pull and one thing that David has pointed out, and Tracy's going to chime in on this at some point, I'm sure, because you were, you were with him when he said this, he's looking for people who've had trauma. It's exactly like Bud Hopkins was. Bud used to always say, look, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. I don't want, there's no need for you for, to be regressed if you're not experiencing some level of trauma and unsettledness about this whole thing. And, and David's exactly the same way. And so what that means to me is that um, he's going to be getting a certain kind, mm -hmm. right, of, mm -hmm. of person. So they're more inclined to be dealing with this type of reality. And I'm, my sense is that Barbara's not getting that type. She gets a, a broad range, but she gets a lot more of the, the very positive experiences. So I think that's fi factoring in to this whole thing. Um, now, look, I'm going to be honest with you, and first thing I want to say is I don't have my own answers here. I don't know, like, who's right? Which is the one true religion? <laughs> Which is the one true belief in ufology uh, or abductions? And I don't know. What I will say is that my opinion is that there's a definite psychosociological element to how this is being reported. It doesn't mean that there's nothing happening. I believe that there is something very important happening. And by the way, maybe when you come back, mm -hmm. there are definite points of commonality that both uh, opposites of the spectrum have in common. So there's something I think that we can agree is definitely happening. It is important as well. But I ask myself, like, what is the likelihood that, um, you know, West Coast spiritual spirituality has it figured out and is on the same page as the ETs 
who have the same spiritual beliefs as they do. I mean, really, because that's what you're getting. We get this in the in um, in what these experiences are talking about. You know, oneness, unity. Uh, we need to eliminate violence and competition and aggression and ego and fear and all of these uh, to prepare for ascension. Uh, let me just give my personal opinion here. This is where I'm just going to kind of level with you. Um, I've never agreed with this idea of ascension. I, I think it's naive and I think it's a dangerous uh, utopian opinion, uh, belief. Uh, I feel that we are biological creatures and as such, yes, doesn't mean we're not spiritual, but we are biological. I am biological, you are biological. And as such, we require, in my view, all of the full range of emotions that have been given to us as these biological creatures that we are, the positive and the negative. We need them to survive. Love is an emotion that brings us together. Fear is an emotion that allows us to prepare for danger. And you know what? Anger helps too a lot of times. All of these have survival functions. And we're not past uh, you know, the point where we don't have to worry about survival. You know, because don't forget something. Every day of your life, since the day you've been born, the universe is hard at work every moment to kill you. Like, seriously. You're born into a world and one day you're going to die. That body of yours is going to die. All right? And it's going to, the universe will succeed, by the way, because everyone who's born dies in all of life ultimately. From all the people and the birds and the bees and every other creature that's out there, they all struggle every single day just to stay alive. Don't forget that. All right. Now, that's not a very new agey or spiritual kind of belief, perhaps, but oh well, that's, this is my perspective on things. And so, therefore, when I hear people saying, well, you have to eliminate your negativity, I feel like this is not really a particularly evolved position, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think that's actually less evolved. But, okay, I'm getting off track, so I'm going to get back on track. <laughs> um, but there is definitely this divide. Uh, let's call it West Coast. Um, I mean, I'm being simplistic here, but let's just say like West Coast, New Age, good ET scenario versus East Coast, not very spiritual, bad ET approach. I think there's something of that going on. And it's sort of mirrors, if you really think about it the kind of divide between liberal and conservative in our culture. You really think about it. I, I actually come, think more and more that this divide in ufology, good ET versus bad ET, is something of a mirror of liberal versus conservative political viewpoint. I'm not saying that every person who believes in one is a liberal and every person who believes in the other is a conservative, but I do think that there is something profound about uh, that connects them to each other. So that, for example, the idea about these ETs being good, you hear all and, uh, over and over again about the need to eliminate fear from our perspective. And uh, that's exactly, um, you know, what's the current issue right now in the US is the whole migrant caravan. And you have liberals saying, don't fear these people. They're positive, they're good, they're gonna help. And, you, and on the other side of it, it's like, I do fear them because maybe they're not all nice people. Maybe they're as criminals. Maybe they're as, you know, and they're going to compete with working class people for jobs and all of that stuff. So that's the two sides of it, right? And I think you see the same thing in the UFO field. I believe this attitude is this, that same type of divide. Whereas in the UFO field, though, it's much more, uh, the only difference that I'm seeing is, the good ET scenario is overtly spiritual, by and large, and the negative ET view is not really spiritual at all. And by the way, I just want to point out that in Jacob's assessment, those beings, the mantids and the greys, are not only, not only are they not spiritual, but they're, they're like, um, they have nothing. There's like no redeeming qualities that they have that make them positive or, or loving. In, in his view, we are the loving creatures. We, human beings, are the ones who actually have the capability 
of being much more advanced than they are. The only real advantage they have, in his opinion, is that they've got the ability neurologically to, to control us. They, they get close enough to us and they can just, they can just control us. So anyway, I, I'm basically almost done here. I just want to ask, so can both of these be true? Are we dealing with a couple of partial truths? Is what David seeing a partial truth? Uh, is, are the, the side of the good ETs? Is, is there some truth to that? I'm actually inclined to think yes to both. You've got a lot of interesting stories of human-looking people who appear to be non-human. You know, in other words, human-looking ETs that have infiltrated our society going back through most of the 20th century. And they don't all seem like they're evil or hubrids or they don't have the kind of incompetent social skills that you get in Jacob's work. Now, I, just because there are stories of these types of things doesn't mean that that's proof, but they are worth consideration in my view. So I think that, you know, there's enough for us to consider that there's a, a large a large reality here. And I didn't even get to talk about Carla Turner, but I know we were talking earlier about that. Yeah, I so want to bring, bring that up that. in a second. So in fact, how about, I think I've basically said everything I want to say here right now. Okay. You want to come in and join me? Sure. For the rest of this? I would love to. I'm going to move this uh, over here Let's and pull this around. jump over. Okay, and uh, to everyone who's been saying the camera is, is uh, keeps refocusing, I wish I could fix that. It's something new that we're trying this oh. week. And um, how is it bad? It looks good to me. I'm looking yeah, at it right here. It, it's some people thought it was because uh, you're moving your hands and maybe it was trying to sort of, of course, I'm trying it. to freak out the camera. I'm trying to defeat the camera. Like the camera thinks it can focus on me all the time. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> this is so, so him at home. <laughs> <all right. laughs> okay. So, so many things. Uh, so many. Th I've been trying. It's hard. I'm sure you guys experience this too. You're trying to listen to Richard and you're trying to pay attention to people in the chat because people are throwing out some really intelligent thoughts about all of this. So mm. I go back and forth as well. So I sometimes I miss things that he says and when I'm trying to pay attention. And Okay. Okay. So uh, I've got a few things, but I do want to start with a couple of comments. I think it was JJS said 99.999% of abductees never tell anyone. And I think that's a really great point uh we are getting a very small percentage so true. when we are looking at research uh from the abduction regressionists i just so. want to say you know for many years i don't do this anymore but i used to write professional resumes that's how i supported myself before ufo books were anything that were worth looking at uh in my my life um i wrote i helped job seekers get jobs mm -hmm. and but here's the thing, I probably met with uh, 10,000 people, one-on-one, -on -one. Mm -hmm. one -on one-on-one, sat in my office, and they'd look over to one side of the wall and it'd be filled with UFO books. And so people inevitably felt comfortable in saying, oh yeah, guess what I saw, or guess what happened right. to me. And, and what I found is I spoke with hundreds of people in that context, and I would say the vast majority, probably 99% of them, had never reported it certainly mm -hmm. um, and maybe if they told anyone maybe they told a family member or a friend and that would be it so i was often the first person they told mm. so i i think that person's right there's a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of um of people out there who are having experiences and no one knows right uh i know there's uh, lots of people in there as well who are saying they you know they haven't told anyone and right yeah, it's a it's a big thing. See, it's refocusing. <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you for bringing that up. That was uh, something that was really important. Um, some other comments. Uh, so, from what we were saying about Jacobs, we know Jacobs is uh, pre-selecting, and Barbara, I don't think she actually is pre-selecting. Right. So, so that. yeah, that's just kind of an interesting thing. I personally can say that. I'm more of the camp where I believe there must be multiple agendas going on. So I think it's very, po I don't think these, this majority of people are uh, lying. You know, you, you might get some skewed data there, but um, I think it's very possible that we have this entire spectrum. 
Yeah, I, I think even hardcore skeptics are not going to go so far as to say they're lying. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, people like Philip Klass in, in earlier years who um, would say that because his whole job was to uh, engage in character assassination of everyone. But I think most serious skeptics today would not say that. They would simply say uh, people are deluded, and, and even that's not in a bad way, uh, but rather we can... Um, you know, just think certain things are true, and they're they're not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. We can we can deceive ourselves in various ways. I think that's what the skeptics would say. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know that that's I don't agree with that, by the way. But I do think that we need to listen to them sometimes because, look. Um, oh, I think it's very important yeah. to listen to the skeptics so that we always keep our perspective. Uh, that's right. In this field, I think uh, in this field of all fields, this is. It's so important for us to stay grounded that way and uh, hear them out. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about Carla Turner, Dr. Carla Turner. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Because she was uh, brought up last week in the chat and or maybe the week of, last week or the week before. And I said, let's save it for this week. Um, I can't remember what the question was, but uh, she's got, you know, I'm not I haven't read all her books Uh I'm most familiar with Masquerade of Angels, and uh, I was watching uh, one of her uh, lectures, lectures yeah. which I highly recommend for everyone. It was really, it's really interesting, and uh, that was partially because that was in our chat room. You know, she goes in and she's talking about uh, implants and cloning and manipulation of the mind. This is all 25 years ago, by the way. Right, but her number one thing that she wanted everybody to know was... Um, you know, we have to be so careful about taking things at face value. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, and that's so relevant for what we're talking about uh, because uh, they could make us think anything. I try to keep this in mind with the things that have happened to me. Um, they could make me think it's super positive. They could give, you know, they could... And, Let's talk about this a little bit. Okay. All right. I, I like this because, first of all, I really admired Carla Turner as well. And um, I really liked her perspective. Like, I wish she had lived longer so that we could have met her. And she would still be valuable. And she'd still be kicking today like she should be. Mm -hmm. But cancer took her and she was way too young back in the mid-1990s. Um, but her attitude was, just as you're saying, she said, like, look, you can't take this at face value. And some people think, oh, no, well, my interaction with these other beings was positive. She says, look, farmers treat farm animals in a positive way. Like, that doesn't mean that they're right. not controlling them and that they don't seek to manage them. Right. And I think that was definitely, I think she saw us as like the equivalent of farm animals to these other beings. I think so too, because she believed uh, from some of her research in particular that the implants weren't just about monitoring us. They were also, uh, it was told to some of her people mm -hmm. that she researched that they were to control us, uh, yeah. that the newer <clears throat> implants were being put uh, behind the ear where the older implants were being put behind the eye of the nasal cavity. These new ones were going into the brainstem, which controlled all of the stimulus between the brain and the body. Yeah, like, so what you see, what you hear, what right. you uh, sense, and so forth. So, yeah, so she believed there, ab there was no way to tell if they have this ability to have absolute control over everything we perceive. So, um, I just think that... So, right, when you have people who uh, are talking about the loving nature of these other beings, and that makes them therefore good, I, you, you could say, look, are you being played? And by right. the way, one of the things that Jacobs right. does point out like they, and this is where like everyone agrees. Mm -hmm. David agrees with Barbara, agrees with every other abduction researcher I've ever encountered. These beings have the ability to make you feel mm -hmm. like love mm -hmm. and to make you feel like they just love you. But the question is, do they? Yeah. The, the US right now has got uh, psychological, psychotronic weapons that can affect our emotions. Right. With, like they know how to induce panic. They know how to induce uh, other kinds of, I think, rage and Maybe they can induce a feeling of love, for all we know. Mm -hmm. uh, Jacobs has said in his research, these beings can um, create a sexual response mm -hmm. just by staring into someone, mm -hmm. in men or women. So if that's true, that's, uh, that's a very powerful level of control. Mm -hmm. and, 
and you know you have other people saying well these beings have just um have given me this feeling of love and openness but does that does that mean that that's actually what's happening and, and the only other thing i'll just say is like when you talk to someone who's had an abduction experience and that's somewhat traumatic for them right mm -hmm. um they do not want to hear any of this love and life stuff like that, that nothing so pisses true. them off more mm -hmm. than hearing this mm -hmm. it's like get that away from me yeah we have a friend who is in the extreme trauma category yeah that's right and uh it's very upsetting for that person yeah he can't stand mm -hmm. hearing about all this oh they're here to help us uh this is a guy who sleeps with a gun like right next to his um next to his bed yeah, is using guns and cameras as a way to sort of uh, try to feel a sense of control. And he's not knowing, alone. Yeah. He's not alone. And there, we have other friends, too. Who, their experiences are so traumatic, like they can't sleep alone in a room. They can't sleep with, alone with the lights off. Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, we've talked about this quite I know. A, we've talked about this before. I'm one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> but there's, there are lots of people out there like it. And I don't yeah. want to say, like I was saying at the beginning, some of us know what's happening and some of us are just trying to figure out what's happening. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, let me rephrase that. We don't know what's happening. Some of us think we know what's happening and we're having it all happen in conscious experience. And then there are a lot of us who are just trying to piece it together from the pieces we have of what's happening. Yeah. So um, it's a difficult thing to navigate for sure. Um. Sorry, this happens every once in a while. I'll look down at comments. You're looking He's at the doing comments. the same thing. It's like we'll be talking and then the yeah. comment will catch us. <laughs> How are we doing for time, by the way? I want to check this. Uh, 9.03. An Another thing I just want to talk about is um, the commonalities between... Now, we're just... Obviously, there are other researchers. You know, there was Dolores Cannon. There is Yvonne Smith. There's Carla Turner. There's other people. Um... Kathleen Martin. Kathleen Martin. Denise Stoner. Yes, absolutely. So we're just, you know, we're really talking about these two camps here. Um, but so what from what we just went over in the last week or two, would you say we found as similarities? I know one thing we found was that the mantis beings are coming up in both as very, very significant. There's mm -hmm. different reports yeah. as to what their role is. So with David Jacobs, the role is uh, far more negative and nefarious, yes? But in both scenarios, they're in charge. Yes, in both scenarios, they're so in charge. They're extremely significant. They're at the top of the hierarchy. That's important. I mean, I, I want to kind of know what do we have in common between the researchers, right. you know? Uh, another, I think an interesting difference, maybe one of the key differences that I would say is is how the hybrids are, are understood. So... With David, hybrids, what well, with David and with all uh, Barbara and the, the good UFO school, let's call it, uh, they all believe in hybrids. Mm -hmm. And they all believe that hybrids are creations of these extraterrestrials mixed with human DNA. So that's mm -hmm. no one, uh, they all seem to agree on that. Mm -hmm. But there's a significant difference from there. So what David argues is that all of his evidence is showing that these hybrids are raised on craft. They're not raised in human society. Mm -hmm. And they are introduced to human society in like their, by degrees, mm -hmm. you know, but maybe through their childhood and teen years, but they're not le allowed to live in human society until they're like young adults. Right. And when they begin that process, they are socially inept to the highest degree. Right. And he describes case after case of this from his abductees who are recounting through regression the absolute, utter, ridiculous incompetence. I want to comment these, on that after. I want to come back to that. Okay. Now, the difference, though, like when you read Meet the Hybrids, mm -hmm. um, totally different. Those hybrids are born into human families. They all have a feeling uh, at some point in their life that they don't belong. They don't belong with their human family. They don't belong here on Earth. They're from out there and so forth. They all get this feeling, apparent, supposedly. And I asked Barbara, like, is that it or is there more? She says, no, because then you go through regression with them and they get more detail out of that. So, okay. 
we'll take that as it is. So that's a significant difference. Like those hybrids, in other words, being raised with human families, um, have often like they understand what loving relationships are and mm -hmm. emotions are. And mm -hmm. She also does speak totally about different. hybrids that are, you know, being bred on the ships until they're at a yes. a, a place of biological similarity to us so that they can be integrated with us. She, she also does, talks yes. about that. that yeah. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, various overlap that you get with um, these different types of researchers. But there is a significant difference that like a lot of these hybrids are born here. Mm -hmm. and, and with David, he says, no, nope, none of them. They're not born here. They're born up there and they're, they're then introduced here. Mm. So there's that whole thing. Okay. Can I just comment on something about uh, what you mentioned about Jacobs there? Because um, someone asked, uh, why, some, why do we think some people, uh, why are some people having these experiences and not others? And I was thinking about J uh, David Jacobs, you know, what if they were after a very specific genetic trait? Like, you know, it's often been said they're after emotions, you know, they're after some trait that's uh, connected to emotion, mm -hmm. right? So, say they isolate that gene and, uh, you know, they are sort of scientifically monitoring. But what would they be interested in? Like, is there, is there something you have in mind, a particular kind of genetic trait? No, if they're, I'm just saying, like, they're, if they're interested in some sort of genetic trait, so they're tracking it through the multiple generations. But the one thing <clears throat> that they don't, you know, so, they, so they're tracking it with technology, but the one thing they wouldn't have is in the nature ver versus nurture, is they wouldn't have the nurture component. They, like, they might be able to bring that gene back, but they might not be able to uh, understand the nurture part of the environment, because now we know epigenetics play a role, right, in mm -hmm. our genes. Right. And so, and, and they can change our genetics. Oh, I see. Okay. So, it, they may have to come in and really study, like ethnographers, like observe and watch and you know, absolutely pull apart every single thing we do as an attempt to try to study that genetic trait that they're trying to pull back in. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think I'm getting it. So they're, in other words, they would need to to be up close and personal with us to, uh, for certain genetic traits to be triggered, they need an external stimulus. Is that what you're saying? I wasn't thinking of it in terms of it being triggered, but in terms of studying it. Uh, but you know what? That could be another thing. And it, maybe there is a component there of needing to trigger something from the nurture perspective. I hope I'm not getting making this too confusing. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting a little sorry. confused myself. So how <laughs> about we go to the next one? Okay, let's go to the next Someone one. Someone out there is going to get it and they'll put in the comments. It's like, you idiot, don't you understand what she was saying? Oh, I was just thinking of the nature versus nurture thing. There are right. two elements to passing on genetic traits. One is nature, genetics. One is nurture and environment. So, um, anyways. Yeah. Leah, let's move on. So, let's go into some of the other questions here. Um, Christine Siebel was saying, um, haven't there been a lot of reported healings from abductions? That oh, was early. yes. So glad she brought this up. Yeah. When I talk with Barbara and when you read Meet the Hybrids and you, when you read Beyond UFOs, yes. So this is, again, diametrically opposite of Jacob's. Jacob says they don't heal. No healings. Never. Barbara says, oh, all the time. All the time. And in fact, she, she gives multiple specific examples mm -hmm. of healings yep. of people by these extraterrestrials. Uh, all types of maladies, uh, miraculous, and even more than that, like almost teaching, uh, when you hear Barbara describe this, teaching kids to like use energy like space Reiki <laughs> to, <laughs> to heal. Yeah. Like if you yeah. cut yourself, there's one example she gave to me, to us, I think, yes. There, yes. of a woman who cut herself uh, gouge yourself deeply with a, a carving knife yeah and these two kids who had been abducted multiple mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. do some kind of reiki Healing motions on her. and her and apparently according to barbara it healed rapidly mm -hmm. uh like ridiculously fast and not so, only that uh barbara saw this woman i think the day after or shortly after this happened this huge gouge and there was absolutely no sign of it Right. This is what she said. Now, I don't know. Is that true? I guess I have to trust her. 
we have to trust her. Is it possible that this this is the case? I don't know. Right, but there Maybe are reports. So there are reports of healing. It's a completely opposite perspective than what you get with Jacobs. Again, for me personally, it brings me back to more of a, a view from the center point where I think uh, multiple agendas need to be considered, but that's just my personal opinion. I, I have to agree because like in his scenario, I really want to ask him this, like how long have these other beings been here? In his opinion, I think he measures it in decades, not centuries. Mm -hmm. Like, they haven't been here for a long, long, long time. Now, he's not saying that there are no other groups, by the way. He's saying they don't matter. <laughs> the only thing that matters right. are those groups that are trying to take over the planet. And he doesn't care about any of the others. So he's, like, his attitude is, look, there may be other groups that are here. I don't care about them. I only care about this group that's actually trying to screw us over right now. Yeah. So if you look at it that way... I would say that it does look like there are multiple groups that are here and watching us. And when you think about it, like, why wouldn't there be? This right. Is, this is Earth. Like, we're, this is a fascinating place. And any group that's got the ability to do any kind of observation in the universe, they find Earth, they find human beings and all the other creatures. Like, how are they seriously not going to be interested? This is a fascinating place. We have water, mm -hmm. we have all these mm -hmm. unique genetic forms. And make no mistake, I think human beings are fascinating creatures mm -hmm. with incredible capabilities. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I think we'd be of interest. Mm -hmm. I've brought this up before and other people have brought this up and I think Farmer Dick just brought this up. It might not always be about us too, right? There might be a mm -hmm. competing agenda going on. <clears throat> What if the infiltration is more about competing with another species <clears throat> that has uh, already made a presence here? You know, so um, there's the potential you, of taking us out of the equation and it's actually more about them. You put out, you had this idea some months ago and I think that you are right on. And it's the idea that what if it's not us but our creation that's of interest to them and that creation being advanced artificial intelligence and the advanced... Mm -hmm. I would just add uh, technological infrastructure that we're creating. Mm -hmm. People might laugh and think, oh, pff, our technological infrastructure is so primitive compared with what they can create, but I don't know about that. Um, in the context of this planet, what we have created, mm -hmm. like with computing tech in the last 25 years, uh, telecommunications, like if you had the ability to create an avatar of yourself to live on that planet, like, this would be a pretty nice place to inherit. Mm -hmm. um, could be, like, an awesome place to inherit. It could be. So, be a hell of a prize. Yeah, I also think of it in, you know, when I think about AI getting out of control, uh, if, if it gets out of control, mm -hmm. uh, when I think about AI growing at an exponential rate where <clears throat> what it can accomplish is no longer fathomable to us, you know, what would it do, where would it go? Say it, it leaves Earth, it goes somewhere else, it does something. I mean, we may not, may not be that exciting. Um, what will it become? What does it have the potential to become? That could be more of their concern that is a direct threat to them. Once it is out of our hands, we created it, it's out of our hands, it's, and it's gone into this other form. That, to me, could be a far bigger threat to them than anything we could ever be or so could the interest in us be sort of a means to an end in that scenario yeah so let, let me take that idea and we'll work sure. with it in a different way uh i used to believe like when i first got into the whole artificial intelligence thing which was almost as early as when i got into ufos um i became convinced early on that these other beings have some important relationship with advanced AI. Mm -hmm. I think that's still true. But what I didn't really consider until recently is that like not all AIs are necessarily the same. So their AI could be very different than the AI that we are in the process of creating. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a certain computer science. I saw that Cylons. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Oh, Cylons. Cylons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, to so we have a certain it. computer science that's creating a certain type of AI. And that's based on 
fundamentally human thought processes and human psychology even. But if these other beings have a fundamentally different psychology and a different type of society, isn't it conceivable that their artificial intelligence would be different? And they would have a different kind of singularity even. Mm -hmm, like they would take the bias so, from that society and take it to this other level. Yeah. And each one would keep take their so own society's bias. Yeah. Is, is it possible that our version of advanced AI might just be particularly frightening to them? Yeah, I mean, is there the potential that, I'm going to go a little there right now, they could look down different timelines of the future? You know, if, if time is simultaneous and time is not linear, do they know something that we don't know? This is so, where Tracy challenges this me is all the where, time because I'm like, come on. This is my normal realm of thinking. I just don't bring <laughs> it up very often. But uh, yeah. this is what our personal right. conversations are like because I tend to right. really put my mind in the place of if time was not linear. Yeah. And uh, I try to go there as a mental exercise. I think it's a healthy thing to at least consider. But back to what we were saying. So there, like, this was your idea as far as I can tell, like this idea that they're interested in our technological creations and they're waiting to see, you know, what happens with our artificial well, yeah. intelligence. Well, it just occurred to me some time ago that Okay, so abductions are really, you know, they really sort of, as far as we know, they came on the scene, you know, when? They, the well, we don't, we don't know of, of good abduction cases till really the 1950s, basically. 50s right. and 60s. So let's just say they've been ramping up the, like crazy since are, the 50s. There are, it would, um, seem, it would seem, early cases of what could be abductions. Like, um... European mm -hmm. uh, history has a number of cases where people would be taken by like gnomes, they would describe, like underground dwellers who would take, uh, take someone for sometimes years and it would feel like 15 minutes right. to them. And like there's a number of these stories in I know you're European reading so lore. many interesting cases right now. Yeah. And uh, who knows, you know, we, I guess we really don't know. There really could be way more. They weren't reported as often, I'm sure. But it right. seems like it's really been taking off in the last, you know, 50, 60 years, right? Since we've really been able to study it to some extent. Well, yeah. I s really started wondering, as I'm sure a lot of you have as well, okay, so we're facing <clears throat> potentially general AI, singularity, you know, fully <clears throat> conscious AI, possibly. I know some people don't believe that, but it's possible, right? Something that we at least can't fathom. So I just wondered if there was something going on with the timing here of these two massive things happening at the same time. And then when David Jacobs started talking about the change, uh, to me, that was another indicator that, okay, these two things are looking like they're going to intersect. That's right. Um, so that can't, I mean, I'm just, I it's can't think that's by accident. Yeah, so think this of is this. what's making me think of these things. Right. You've got an AI singularity happening, like that's happening. Right. How long? 10 years, 20 years? I don't know. It's coming. In the, yeah. in the grand scheme of things, it's happening soon. Yeah. And this whole thing of the change or, and it's not necessarily, you know, the, there's, David believes it's, it's a very, very negative development, but the, the love and light, e, good ET camp thinks that it, it's happening soon as well, but that mm -hmm. is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. But it's all happening like around the same That's right. time if it does. So let's just say we don't know what's going on, positive, negative, whatever, both, whatever. But what, we, what does seem to be going on is this big intersect, this, all of this going on at once. So why, what, So knowing that now, what, what are the theories that we can come up with? You know, this is kind of my... Well, I, my thinking. opinion is that, uh, this is just me, um, but I think that our entire mode of history is speeding up, like speeding up to a crisis point, like a significant... What do you mean by that, by our mode of history? Like the the pace of change in society. So human society has mm. always developed. It's always evolved. But the pace of our evolution, in, in my view, is speeding up dramatically. And our technological capabilities are certainly exponentially um, going vastly, vastly faster than 
ever before, mm -hmm. uh, transforming us so that, I mean, look, we're looking right now at, at the transformation, not simply of our civilization, but our species, uh, transhumanism, which we've mm -hmm. talked about a lot this year. So when you're looking at that, that's a rate of change that is unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are staring down the road at the transformation of the human species. And some people think this is a wonderful thing, and some people think it's the most terrifying thing of all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of the latter group. I actually think it's not a good thing. But there's lots of people who think, oh, it's awesome. It's great. And not, all, not only the transhumanists, but like basically the spiritually inclined people. They think it's wonderful. Let's, uh, let's ascend to the next level. Let's go to the next. Let's stop being this, this low-level humanity. Let's move on to something bigger and better. And I, for me, this is not an opinion. Oh, I think they're talking about two different things, though. I mean, you're talking about the, the people who are pro-transhumanism. I mean, they're they are they are different, but they're similar. They're, like in the sense of, they both believe that there's going to be this big transformation mm. of our society in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, so, so we're back at the same place. Something uh, appears to be coming. Um, I just want to also make a mention, you know, because we've also been talking a lot about 5G lately and how when 5G comes online, that means, you know, all of our uh, appliances are going to be able to talk to each other. Uh, we really a, should do a whole show on that. You know, I, it's really not a UFO should. thing, but so what? Like, no, we, we should, really want to talk about But that. I wanted to bring that back around to the UFO thing. I wanted to actually bring that back around to this whole um, where we are, like David Jacobs calling this this impending thing the change. Right. Remember, I was wondering if um, if the change was a time where this one species could have some form of takeover yeah. of cognitive takeover or or something like that. I also wondered if you know maybe it doesn't go as far as singularity maybe it's something more along the lines of 5g where we have this instead of the internet we have uh, this uh i think i've talked about this before uh this neural network this neural internet this other either the neural internet from cognitive implants mm -hmm. or we have a f this new 5g something in between not the internet not the neural net but the 5G net, this other sort of thing, um, perhaps that new web of connectivity has something to do with the change where they are able to um, um, yes. um, jack into that and that would give them access to all of us, to all of our data, to another level of control. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned this. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Like who, whether it's non-friendly aliens mm -hmm. or a non-friendly human hierarchy, right? Someone's going to take that, that whole network yeah. over. Listen, we're we're really got some serious problems down the road with this. All right, when you have a, a full 5G interconnected network where everything in your house is monitored. The Washington Post put out a reprehensible article just a day or two ago, which I was telling you about, like figures, because the Washington Post is only reprehensible. There's no redeeming quality to this publication at all. But one guy puts out an article comparing in the holiday season, should you buy Siri, uh, Alexa, Alexa, yeah, or um, Google Assistant. Right, right, right. And he right. compares. It's like, my God, like you're a shameless man. And he also says... Now, even though the Washington Post is owned by Bezos, I'm not, I'm not necessarily promoting Alexa, although at the end of the article he says, you should get Alexa. <laughs> yeah, but, right. but, but what's really awful about it is like he's just talking about how important it is to be able to open your garage door by giving a voice command. I'm like, are you that lost, dude? Uh, the one hopeful thing in that whole article were the comments below. Even though it's Washington Post, even though everyone's like utterly like following this conventional neocon awful newspaper, almost everyone in the comments was like, get out of here, man. We want nothing to do with Good. any of that 24-7 Orwellian nightmare. Um, but here's the thing, back to your point. Uh, that world is coming, all right? China's got the horrible social credit system uh, and it's going to be mandatory for all Chinese in a year and a half. Right now it's voluntary. 
when there's all of this pressure for people to do it. I'd love for us to put a link in there to what we watched about the uh, so China there, well, there's social some good credit ones. system. Well, Fantastic. Okay, later. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go. Um, the point is that in that society, if you don't know what this is, just go look it up right now. We'll talk about it in the future. But it's the ultimate method of totalitarian social control. Like there's nothing more efic efficient than this. And, and it's basically combining total surveillance and giving you literally a grade, a social number by which like your whole life is determined. The, your credit, uh, where you can live, whether you can take high speed public transportation or not. Uh, whether your kids can go to good schools or bad schools and whether you can leave it. the country or not and it also it's partly at least in china based on who your friends are so if you have friends who have bad rankings that affects you think about what that does for people like in their friendships like if someone has a, uh, if you have a friend with a bad rating like they'll all everyone will shun that person anyway uh, once someone gets full, and you think it's not coming to the Black West. Mirror. If, if Black Mirror. If you guys Mirror. haven't seen Black Mirror, Black Mirror, check it out. If you think it's not coming to the West, you better think again. It's already coming to the EU. They're working their way into it. And it's already here. Like I was just already... going to say, it's already here. This is what all the data mining is about. We probably yeah. have this social credit system that's already going on that is beneath the surface. In China, it's above the surface. I assume here it's probably beneath the surface. Well, it's already happening in the sense of like PayPal and Amazon, uh, you know, not allowing you to, to uh, use their platforms if they think that you're a proponent of hate speech. However, that is loosely defined by like the Southern Poverty Law Center. Like, are you kidding me? They're the biggest joke around, but we'll get onto them another time. They're really, they're awful. Um, but if you're, if you get that label, then you're done. Your, your financial, economic career, you can be completely ruined mm -hmm. or YouTube will deplatform you. And I'm going to be honest, I'm waiting for them to come after me. Don't even say that. I'm waiting for it to happen one day. All right, seriously. He says this when we're having our conversations. I'm like, don't even well, say this. A, I don't like being told what I'm supposed to say. Of so course. like that automatically triggers me yeah. and makes me want to say exactly the triggers opposite. Triggers all of us. Right. So, right. So, but I'm someone like, I'll do it. I've got enough of a, enough of a small public profile that I could just see someone saying, ah, let's go after him. Mm -hmm. And... How long will it take? I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll be lucky and it'll never happen. But it can happen because it happens to other people. My point is simply this 5G total comprehensive surveillance system, total facial recognition, total yeah. voice recognition, yeah. uh, monitoring your spending, your all of your, like including how you live. Including public humiliation if we're talking about China still. That's right. Mm -hmm. If, if you if you jaywalk or if you smoke in a public place where you're not supposed to, like they'll immediately there's like in certain places there's large screens out there. They'll actually put your face up That's there right. and shame you. Like holy crap! So we think, well, that's China. Yeah, it's 1.3 billion people. So keep that in mind. But that is happening, and you can see it happen. So back to the ET thing, if we can bring it yeah. around. <laughs> Sorry. So if there. <clears throat> Think about it, though, right? Mm -hmm. This is what you were saying. Yeah. You have negative ETs, let's say the Mantids and their hybrid teams. Mm -hmm. Let's say they do the change. They would most definitely, <clears throat> you know, it's one thing to have neurological control directly with people, but that can have limitations. The way he described it is one hybrid might be able to control a few humans, but not like a whole bunch at once. Right, so how do you control a whole bunch? You do it through 5G and through total surveillance and, uh, and this whole system. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. Yeah, so that were, there we go. Those were our thoughts about 5G, so. The thing is, ultimately, in my opinion, if these greys and mantids are gonna take over and do the change, um, is it just like a case of out with the old boss, same same as out with the new, in with the new boss, same as the old boss? In other words, if they're controlling us, or if a human group is controlling us through this method, it is still a situation of total control. Yeah, like th this is it would seem this is to me the scariest outcome, and this is this is like I have to honestly say like where. The, uh, the good ET, like the people who believe that everything's going to be great, we're going to ascend. I don't understand. Like, I don't get how they can think this 
in the face of what we're dealing with in the development of our actual society. Well, one thing I would just want to say with the good ET side of things, you know, is it possible if there are multiple agendas, I think I might have said this earlier, that um, there are some species or some groups that are have an interest in helping us out, you know, and if they were going to do that, would they walk through the front door to do it? Or would they try and sort of do something through the side door? Like, what I mean by that is, would they have some sort of um, method of encouraging us or um, giving us ideas? I don't know, but I just think it is possible that um, while we have these malevolent groups, there are benevolent groups that perhaps are also uh, trying to assist humans. So uh, it's possible, you know. Well, if I, I were I one know, of those... I think it's possible. If I were one of those good ET groups, I'd say we have to nuke the bad ETs. It's the only way to be sure. Nonviolent or not, you got to nuke the bad guys. The only way to be sure. Remember that movie? No. Aliens. Oh, that the, was a long time ago. I got to... It's a great movie. We're talking about aliens. Let's bring up the great movie, Aliens. Yes. Al right. Number two, the second one with Sigourney Weaver... It's the only way to be sure. <laughs> we do have to watch it again. It's been a long okay. time. But anyways, we're, here we go. Um, look, it's uh, look at the time. I'm just pointing this out. Oh my gosh, we just yeah, kept we, going. We gotta like. So we gotta do this. Before we, we wrap it this. up. Okay. Before I've enjoyed we wrap this it up, conversation. Like, have you? Yeah, me too. Has been, hope, hope everyone's enjoyed this. Yeah, I hope this has been. I'm sorry. There's absolutely no way for us to totally keep track of the chat. Uh, Michael and Lori are doing an amazing job as usual, and they have thrown a whole bunch of questions in here from all of you for us. So we won't be able to get through all of them, but we're just going to have a little glance right now, maybe take a question or two, okay? All right, real quick like. All right. Now, 3D the Destroyer, Mr. Dolan. Are Sounds like Mr. Anderson. Are, are you, you familiar with the book Future Shock by Alvin Toffler? Oh, man, I'm embarrassed to say, like, yeah, but like from 30 years ago. So I gotta reread it. Okay. Thanks for pointing out my grand it's, ignorance on it. But look, I'm not gonna lie. Can't I, I can't read, make you this can't up. can't have read every single book there is. The, the thing is like, if you if anyone gets into the habit of, and I can tell you this for sure, like anyone who's got any public profile, like their, uh, their tendency is like, they never want to admit they don't know something. Like no, yeah. who wants to do that? And I, I've had to give up a long time ago. Like. I have to, if I don't know something, better just damn well admit it, because otherwise you look really dumb. So Toffler, yeah, of course I've heard of it. I, I just haven't, I haven't read it in a while, so I guess I should. Okay. We'll go back over Toffler. Can I read the wiki, or is that cheating? <laughs> I can read the book? <laughs> okay, so why don't you do, uh, this is JJS, why don't you do a video chat with Jacobs on YouTube? Um, I'm in communication with David, and... Uh, I'm going to work on his schedule and in, in the way that he wants to do this. I don't know if he wants to do a video chat. He is willing to do an interview, and I'll I'll take what I can get with David. Okay. So we we are planning to do it, and I think we'll we'll have something before long. Uh, this is from Drew Richard. Do you think this is in re reference to uh, Dr. Carla Turner? Her aggressive cancer was a result of abductions ex uh, slash oh. experiments conducted, uh, such as a byproduct of those. Yeah, I don't know. I've wondered about it. She died fairly young. She was a heavy smoker. Uh, it just has to be said, and that was part of her culture. And so, did the uh, cigarettes cause the cancer? I mean, most people would probably say they were the biggest contributor. She did die. It was a rapid, uh, I think, a pretty aggressive cancer. And she was, I think, maybe in her 50s. I don't think she was that old. So okay. I don't know. I just wouldn't know what to say. But but there are rumors of that, right? That there was something. Yeah, but rumors. I don't know what rumors. to make of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, unless I were to come across something that was really suspicious, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't want to go down that road and no, make I that assumption. No, I totally understand. Uh, do you know what this is? Oh, uh, what do you think about the Black Knight and its purpose? That's a uh, an alleged satellite. Is there was a Black Knight satellite? Uh, I think this is the same satellite from the 1950s. And, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, if I'm wrong, then forgive me. I do know that there were um, 
There was an alleged satellite being tracked in Earth orbit long before Sputnik. Sputnik, if you don't know your history, was the first man-made satellite that we know of. 1957, the Soviets, the Russians did it, and then we followed. But there were claims of satellites prior to this that were being monitored. I think the Black Knight is the name of that. Uh, unless there's something more contemporary, I, I don't know. And I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer to that. There's a look in our field. There's uh, claims that come up all the time, and they're not all nonsense. I'm not saying that they are, but it's hard to confirm. It's hard to get detailed information on all of them, and uh, there's a lot that I don't know. So I just do my best. This is what the else? same person right here. Uh, oh, someone says... Uh, no, this is the same person. ...thinking outside the box. I think the Black Knight would provide us with a lot of answers about our past. Thanks for talking about my question. Yes, Nikola Tesla said he heard sounds coming from it. Tesla, wow. Okay, Tesla died in 1943, so uh, if that's the case, then that thing is way earlier than I thought it was. Okay. I think I think we're done. What do you think? Okay, I just... Well, I'm always the one trying I'm, to wrap it up. No, Trace sometimes is trying it's to reversed, bring it longer. But I'm just going <clears> to say... Uh, Mike Rossi, thank you and thank you everyone for the super chats. We appreciate that so much. Uh, Mike, I just want to address something that you said. You uh, suggested that we do a Q&A night. What do you think about that? Yeah. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll that. And uh, also, since you are a member and some of you are, we do have one coming up this Saturday night. Itself. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, we don't want to sort of single that out. but Well, look, for just anyone who's a member of Original <laughs> Members, we're doing a live Q&A uh, December 1st. I think it's this Saturday. Yeah, we have a list yeah. on our site. Yeah, so. we have a lot of members here. But, well, you know, look, we do, we do these live things on YouTube uh, every week, and mm -hmm. so we're answering your questions here. We, we try to be available. That's basically what it comes down to. We mm -hmm. just do our best. This, this show is very important to us. You know, uh, the members' site is very important to us, but this, this is very important to us as well. So we, uh, we'll take that suggestion, and I think that would be a, a fun thing to do. Uh, so, yes, we're going to wrap it up. All right. Oh, you want to? I'm seeing, I'm seeing comments scroll. And uh, someone just says, do your homework, Richard Lal. I, I don't know what that refers to. I, I do my best. Not perfect. <laughs> um, someone asked me about Karen Hudis. I saw that. Um, I probably shouldn't get into the whole thing. She's uh, an economist. She worked at World Bank, and she believes that there are these very uh, tall extraterrestrials that are kind of running the show. Um, I've had looked into her, and all I'll say is, I don't know that I consider her reliable, but um, maybe I'll come back to that at some point. Okay, great. I, did, right. I just saw the comment, uh, for those of us that can't, can't be members, uh, we'd love to have it on this show, and, and uh, we will definitely consider that. We would, I think we should do it on this show, too. Someone says, more Grant Cameron. Totally cool with that. And someone asked me about David Pilates. Look, David and I have been trying to get this together for the longest time. I'm going to have to go back with David. Yes, we keep missing each other. Yes, because some people in the chat were saying tonight, like, something that's really important to address is there are a lot of missing people, and that is true. So, uh, but that will probably be the night that that comes up more is uh, when we when we do David right. Pilates. So, yeah. And I'm going I'm going to mention one thing, because I just saw Drew writing. Just remember, folks, he says, Richard's a flat earther because of the map on the wall. Like, I know he's joking. <laughs> There's Drew? a globe. That's great. There. No, there's, there's a also a globe. Yeah, there's also a globe in the corner. Uh, I have to point this out. So, like, A, I'm going to speak for myself. You could, I am not a flat earther. I'm not. Never was. Not a flat earther. That is what we call a mercator projection, folks. If you don't know what that is, you can look that up. And, no, Australia is not on there because, look, it's an artistic rendering. It's a piece of art. It's just meant to look cool. It's not an actual, like, don't read into it. It's just something that we like the way it looks. There you go. Okay, I just want to say, if you guys enjoyed the show tonight, please don't forget to like the video. That's one way that you can really help support Richard's research uh, by subscribing to YouTube. There are notifications. If you don't want to miss uh, a video that comes out, uh, signing up for notifications is uh, a way that you won't. We also have a newsletter, and we put it out every week, mm -hmm. and it sort of keeps you on top of uh, all the content that we put out every week. So uh, you can sign up for that. On I got to say... Tracy creates that newsletter, and it's the best-looking newsletter anywhere. Oh. Like, and it's amazing. Thank you. How you did that? It's Thank incredible. You.
Try to so put some fun go. stuff in there for people. I put some fan art and some other things. Yeah, very uh, cool. But uh, it's free. Uh, you can sign up for that. I think I just saw Pursuing X put a, a, a link there. And, um, yeah, you can check it out. That's it. See what you think. You'll know exactly what we're doing. So thank you, everyone. Thank you again for the Super Chats. And for those who are just here, it's such a wonderful way to support Richard's research. So we, we appreciate all of you. And we want to right. say a special thank you to Lori and Michael because they are amazing. As always. Thank yes. you, guys. Yes. Okay, everyone. Till next time. a wonderful night. We'll look forward to looking at the comments. Later. Take care.